Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the QT Faculty of Law, to our symposium on copyright law and the creative industries. Uh, the purpose of this event is to bring together creative practitioners, uh, cultural, institutional representatives, and uh, legal academics and lawyers uh, to discuss the intersection between copyright law, creativity, and culture. As is always the case at QT, um, in keeping with the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where QT now stands and recognise that these have always been places of teaching and learning. We wish to pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play within the QT community. Uh, Michael Guhoy has uh, recently uh, published uh, the book Artificial Intelligence, Robots and the Law with one of his uh, collaborators from the University of New South Wales. Um, his research is very much interested in the intersection of new technology and the law, including the regulation of artificial intelligence and the impact of new technologies on power and governance. His talk today is GPT-3, Copyright and Power. <laughs> Thanks, Matthew. Um, the uh, base remit today being uh, copyright, uh, discussing copyright, and I uh, thought it timely to talk about um, GPT-3, which at the time of recording has only been out a couple of months. Um, so still early days in its, in its um, development, and the issues bubbling up include those, I say, uh, of copyright and power. Um, I'm quite interested in the, the interaction of technology, law and power and how those things interact. One of the remits of law, as we know, is that um, it seeks to limit or circumscribe or redress power imbalances. Um, it, we think of employment law and, and uh, consumer law as two examples of that. But it also can... Um, be used or, or in some ways to create or exacerbate or even reinforce those same power imbalances. Um, power interacts with law in a number of different ways. Uh, it can ignore, um, evade or turn a blind eye to power, to, to law. So uh, we think of Uber, uh, we think of those companies that rush in to um, unregulated areas and start, um, start doing what they do without law being involved. Um, power can lobby to make law um, or to change law in its favour. We see the big um, tech platforms uh, particularly doing that and, and uh, we'll look a little later at some, some of the work of Julie Cohen in that regard. Uh, it can enforce the law in its favour. So different ways of using the law or um, working around the law to get what it needs. Um, so we think of contract here where the platform companies ask you to agree to their terms of service uh, and then you're bound to those contractual terms. It can find loopholes in the law and take advantage of those. Or it can use the machinery of law, the procedural aspects of law to grind down uh, those less powerful. So a number of interesting interactions between law and power. And the use of technology and the technology companies that are finding that we're finding are the most powerful in the, in the world these days, starting to exacerbate those power imbalances um, by using law. So we're looking at the technology is GPT-3, the law is copyright, and we'll see how power interacts with that. So the technology, as I said, is GPT-3. What is it? Um, it's a, a generative pre-trained transformer. It's the third iteration of OpenAI's um, model. It's a language model which um, uses deep learning, machine learning, to um, create text, to create um, new text. Um, its remit was to seek to find the next word in a chain of words and to predict what word would come next. 
And in that way, it builds and builds and creates new, uh, new text. Uh, it uses natural language processing, trained on massive data sets. And um, those data sets have increased. As we've seen data increase, we've seen computer power increase. Uh, these type of models and uh, machines are becoming more and more powerful. So we see the common crawl data set um, used by search engines, among other things, was used by the OpenAI to train uh, GPT-3. It has nearly a trillion words in its, in its um, archive. GPT-2, the previous iteration, used um, 1.5 billion parameters, so the connections between the computer, uh, in the computer, between nodes, um, that are triggered uh, when impulses come through. 1.5 billion parameters for GPT-2, trained on 8 million web pages. GPT-3 has 175 billion parameters, so it needs a massive computer to be able to operate. Uh, and the model is trained on many millions more uh, web pages, and um, um, the way, it, the way it works and the way machine learning works is that you, you get a lot of data, you feed it into a model which is, uh, which is set up to have an output. Um, the data in this case um, was, um, uh, as I said, um, a whole lot of data um, from Common Crawl, um, from Web Text 2, from Books 1 and Books 2, and from Wikipedia. Um, those, those data were then fed into the model uh, and in an unsupervised manner uh, for the model to uh, find patterns in that data. And then once it found certain patterns in the, in the language model, it, um, OpenAI then used supervised learning to fine-tune the model um, to, on much smaller data sets. Now, what can it do? It, um, it, it can, and I'll show you a quick example, um, it can uh, create extremely lifelike uh, text uh, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. This is a, a website which shows examples of the type of text it can create. So in this, um, in this blog, created by somebody using GPT-3, the um, italicized words are words created by GPT-3. So the blog is talking about the work of GPT-3 and how it's, um, um, how it's been used. And then GPT-3 says, something that has been really fun about this collaboration has been watching how GPT-3 writes in response to things Tinkered Thinking, the blog, has written. When Tinkered Thinking adds a line of humour, for example, GPT-3 is very likely to follow up with something funny as well. This kind of feedback in the text has actually produced some pretty organic feeling conversation in the episode. That's the machine. That's the machine. It's incredible. Um, incredibly lifelike, um, incredibly um, uh, um, powerful. So it, it not only does that, but it can create um, uh, new works of, of fiction. Uh, it creates poetry. It, it, people have used it to create websites. It creates, um, it creates um, its own code. It creates new code to create websites. It, it's extremely um, powerful. Um, people are starting to talk of it as if it was artificial general intelligence, but I think we're a long way from that. So the questions about law, what is the, what is the law here, copyright? Where, where do the questions come up? What about the data that it uses, the data that's being crawled from the web? Um, as I said, Common Crawl, it used Web Text 2, Books 1 and Books 2, and Wikipedia. 
So the, da the data crawled by common crawl, what common crawl does, it's been around for about a decade, it crawls the, the, the whole internet and takes a snapshot of the internet. Now, search engines can use this to, to be, allow you to search the, the internet without searching the live version. They crawl the web and create a sort of copy. Um, books one and books two are um, sort of book corpora uh, that are on the, on the web that, that actually digitize books. Um, Google Books is the most probably famous example. Um, it, um, as, as we'll see in a minute, has uh, many trillions of words as well. But Common Crawl, um, um, the data that they got from Common Crawl constituted about 45 terabytes of, of raw text. Um, now, that text is taken from all over the internet. Who owns it? Who has copyright in it? Who, who knows? Um, who is who? Um, probably the original author, but but um, who's going to claim against OpenAI for that right, the right in that copyright through Common Crawl's use of it? Uh, extremely interesting questions. Um, Common Crawl is a non-profit organisation. Um, it crawls every month the web and takes a snapshot. It says that it takes a copy of the internet, a copy of the internet each month. The Books Corpora, um, Google Books, as I said, uh, allows you to search more than 200 billion words, digitized books. Um, now, there's, that's been canvassed in the past, uh, Google Books, the use of those, those books, I won't cover it here. Um, then the question is, who owns copyright in the model itself? Now, that's lo likely to be OpenAI. Uh, but GPT-2 was, was, um, was released open source and was free to use. GPT-3, for a number of reasons, uh, isn't. You only can access it through an API. And uh, Microsoft now is the exclusive uh, licensee, licensor of GPT-3, Microsoft. As I said in, in, the, in the beginning, you need a, a company that has a big computer to run, this, to run this process and to store the data. Uh, Microsoft inserted $1 billion into the development of GPT-3, so it has an interest in it. But we see the power now, the power dynamic come into play. Microsoft, one of the big tech firms, right? And then the question is, who owns the output of GPT-3? You enter into the API uh, a prompt. So me, as the user, will enter a prompt, um, start of a sentence, push generate text, and it generates text. Who owns copyright in that? Is it me? Is it the, is it the open AI? Or is it the original um, copyright owner in the text that was trawled or crawled? Interesting questions. There's the monkey that uh, Bruce was talking about earlier. Um, is, it, is, it, is that the case, right? That we, that we don't own the copyright in this, that nobody owns the copyright in this. Now, the power. OpenAI's mission is um, to create AGI, to create a highly autonomous system that outperforms humans at most uh, economically valuable work. Right? AGI will be, if it's attained, will be one of the most powerful things that humans have created. And as I said, Microsoft has grabbed on to this. Right? Um, now, this is a quote from Yanis Varoufakis, uh, Varoufakis, who says in, in an introduction to a new edition of, of the, um, the Communist Manifesto, 
says, it quotes the manifesto's words, a society that has conjured up such gigantic means of production and of exchange is like the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld, whom he has called up by his spells. Then he says, it is only big tech, big pharma, and the few corporations that command exceptionally large political and economic power over us that truly benefit. Those, those are the ones who have control over this, and they are using copyright, among other laws, to extend or, or uh, increase that power. Julie Cohen, who I mentioned earlier, in her book, uh, Between Truth and Power, said, the new platform firms learn to appropriate, uh, appropriate other strands of anti-maximalist rhetoric for their own purposes, latching onto the themes of commons, open content and fair use to advance their own interests. And as platforms became more adept at flexing their political muscle, defeating wave after wave of proposed new legislation, the copyright legislative juggernaut began to lose momentum. And we see that the flexing of that muscle continue. She then says, some argue that technology-based copyright enforcement initiatives threaten both, both expressive freedom and creative experimentation. That's the counter-argument. While others worry about the social and economic costs of the copyright that evades existing protections. Meanwhile, those attempting to evaluate the complex landscape of platform behaviour have debated whether to count platforms as civil libertarians, rapacious appropriators of, of creative labour, obstructors of justice, or privatised extensions of the surveillance state. All uses of law to aggregate power. She says, the new normal, the normative and practical authority of platforms, including increasingly the sovereign power to determine the exception, Carl Schmitt's uh, definition of power, has become both something taken for granted and a powerful force reshaping the law in its own image. So the use of technology, um, law, um, to create powerful, uh, uh, powerful companies and powerful operators uh, is something that is continuing to develop. And GPT-3 and the use of copyright um, by the big powerful companies uh, will be something to keep an eye on into the future.